right, today's Friday, April 8th, 2011, and this is Stephen Fagan, the Associate Curator at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. And the interview that we're doing today is part of the museum's ongoing oral history project. And today it's my great pleasure to be here with Nick Shishelli. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time while you're here in Dallas to uh, meet with us and share your story. Oh, you're welcome. At the beginning, sir, I'd like, just for the record, to get your full name, date and place of birth, and a little personal background about yourself to get us started. Okay, great. Well, my name is Fred Nick Shishelli. I go by my middle name. Um, I was born in Monroe, Michigan, and uh, I'm actually living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida today. But uh, back in 1963, Steve, um, we were actually studying U.S. presidents. And how this hall started with me and everybody that started different was that, that day my teacher said, we're going to study President Kennedy. So we were learning about his football games on the, you know, out in the Cape, and we were learning about, you know, how he was, his great speeches and all that, and his young family. Well, um, about 1.30 in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I saw my principal walk in. This is in Monroe, Michigan. And she walks in, and she's crying. Now, back then in the 60s, police officers, teachers, people of importance, you were sort of scared of them. You had a, 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 a line between respect and fear. So... Those people weren't human. You, they didn't go to the grocery store to eat. These people were your teachers. These were uh, we held them on a pedestal. Well, that's how I felt back in 1963. I was nine years old, and I saw my principal crying. It was a woman. Uh, her name was Mrs. Bill Meyer. And then I saw my teacher begin to cry and put her hands in her face, uh, and I face her hands. And so um, she immediately left the, the principal, and the teacher came out and said, "There's been an accident." The president has had an accident in Dallas, and can we all bow our heads and say a prayer? Of course, back then, I guess you could do that at a public school. Um, she dismissed school, and I vividly remember being on the bus, looking out the window, depressed, because I had told my teacher, I'm going to meet President Kennedy. And she walked over to me, and she said, now you'll never meet him. So two hours before I was going to meet him, when I grew up, and then she said, you're never going to meet him. And I remember vividly also that the kids on the bus were all laughing and playing. It was a normal day getting out of school. But for me, I was, I don't know why I was upset, but I just felt that I wasn't going to meet him. When I opened the door and got home, there was my mother. And my mother was weeping, just crying. And my sister was three years older, crying. And I said, Mom, what's wrong? And she said, the, the president is dead. And I didn't quite understand it yet. And, and I said, well, so, I mean, you know, what happened? And she explained to me what happened. And she said, well, he was like a son to me. And I said, what do you mean he's like a son? I, I'm your son. I remember, I'm nine. And she says, he was like a son to everybody. And she said, I loved him. Well, love in our family wasn't thrown around. The word love wasn't thrown around too much. I love you, I love you. It was, we knew we all loved each other, but it came out, I, I loved him. So I didn't quite understand that. And I went that night, I made my mom a scrapbook. And the next morning when she got up at six o'clock in the morning, I presented her with a scrapbook. So I sort of like to say today I'm still making my mom a scrapbook because I have over 20,000 items now on President Kennedy in my collection. So that's how it got started. Is Kennedy the first president you have memories of? Yes. Yes. Would you watch him on television, see him in Life magazine? Never remembered any of that. Okay. Only the first, only at school do I, do I remember him showing us pictures. So I don't even remember anything prior to that, that day. Were your parents Democrats? Um, my parents were Democrats. Yep, but my dad voted for Nixon. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, was it was it the Catholicism? Was that his issue? With uh, no, I I don't know what what his issue was. I, I never really asked him. I wish I would have. My mother voted for Kennedy. My dad voted for Nixon. So, and I didn't know that till twenty or thirty years later. What was the rest of that weekend like for you? Oswald's arrested, Ruby shoots Oswald, the funeral on Monday. How did well, this affect a nine-year-old? Well, I did see Oswald shot on TV, and, and that I did see. And my, my, my interest grew even more. And, and then I started buying bubblegum cards. And all of a sudden, I went to the local store, and within two weeks, they had, it's called Kennedy cards, and they had a slice of flat bubblegum with it, and there was five cards, and I had to collect a whole series, you know, of 150 cards or whatever it was, not knowing, though, that those bubblegum cards was probably the first thing that I collected. And then in 1966, my family went to Washington, D.C., when I got home, I made, uh, I took six white horses, plastic horses, I made a street, and then I took a, uh, a caisson, 
and I took a little HO model car case and I painted it black inside and it was shiny and I had a Munsters coach model. I took the coffin handles off of that and I put it on the side of it and I took a flag I ripped off from a stick flag and I had the six white horses. And then I made a, a, a grave. I made his grave out of the white picket fence made out of index cards. And I mounted a piece of index card and I sprinkled glue and I put the tr HO train, the grass you sprinkle, and I put a, a bolt and I put a little lighter fluid in and it lit. My mom said, take this down to the Monroe Evening News. I took it down to the Monroe Evening News and there I am, uh, now 12, with Kennedy's six white horses and the grave in front of me and said, he, and I wrote Mrs. Kennedy asking her for something. I did get a reply, but she didn't give me anything. But a little known congressman named Wes Vivian of the 11th District of Michigan saw this. He had went to the White House and Kennedy handed him his famous PT-109 tie clip. He gave it to me and he wrote a beautiful picture saying, your, your love for President Kennedy astounds him and that he wants to add to your collection. The President gave me this, I'm giving it to you to add to your collection. So that really fired me up having a you know, letter on the stationery of a U.S. congressman. Uh, there, so. Now you're 12 by this time, so the assassination was several years in the past, mm -hmm. and yet you're still so fascinated by this subject, you go to the trouble of making a little model of Arlington Cemetery. Yes, my friends all went to see the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, I had no interest. <laughs> I wish I would have now. Uh, I never drank, never smoked, never got into the habits of that, uh, but Kennedy for me was my hobby. It, it became a hobby, and I, I enjoyed just getting stuff and buying it and, and reading and and the more I learned about Kennedy the, the more I liked him the more I, I thought wow what a loss this is a really deep loss and and maybe I shouldn't forget but maybe I need to help that nobody else forgets I can help as many people as I can to just to remember him a little bit longer never knowing that would I would do that tell me a little bit about your career in, in the fast food industry and, and and how you kept up your hobby during that time. Well at 26 years old I bought a McDonald's. McDonald's helped me out and actually co-signed my note because I sure didn't have any money. And they liked me and they co-signed a note for me and I bought a McDonald's in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and I thought well gee if my McDonald's is here I might as well put Kennedy in it. So uh, I remodeled it to look like the 60s in red and white and black and I had a TV monitor there and I would have now I would have a lot of music from the 60s but I, I would stick it in with Kennedy campaign commercials uh, and then I found a photograph of of Kennedy running for president and he was at a restaurant in Miami sitting in the back of his car and he had a McDonald's cup in his hand and with the McDonald's sign in the back the speedy sign and I had that blown up I had the arches put in neon and that was the focus of the museum of my museum of the McDonald's when you walked in because at the time you could do anything pretty much you want in your decor so it was known as you know the, the McDonald's Kennedy McDonald's so I, I carried that into my work and my employees knew who he was and if a, if a high school person came in and they asked me anything about Kennedy if I could answer their question I gave them a free Sunday or if I could ask them a question I made it rather simple for them Okay, but the local high school kids would come in from Fort Lauderdale High, and I say, "All right, I mean, I got a question on JFK for you." And they wouldn't sometimes know it, but tomorrow they'd give me the answer because they asked their father. And then I'd say, "All right, you get your free Sunday." It was just, I just, in, in, you know, imbued my work with, with, with my, what I like to do. Did any of the McDonald's executives visit your your establishment? You know, they did, and they they chuckled, they laughed, but they thought it was pretty neat because it was different. And I remember little kids used to come in and say, I had the cups in, a, in, a, in like a museum case next to the, the picture of President Kennedy. And they said, is that the cup that he, that he touched? And I said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, that's great. Yeah. Uh, you were still collecting on the side that was still your hobby to accumulate these yep, things? Yep, at 26, yeah. Then I, uh, I started going for bigger things, you know, that I, I wanted something that he wore and something that he maybe touched, a letter, documents, and I, you know, I, financially it was much better off you know there um, and then I met a man through Parade Magazine uh, in Toledo Ohio there was a Parade Magazine with Marty Underwood who was President Kennedy's advance man he worked for Richard Daly he worked for Lyndon Johnson he was called the best advance man in the country Lyndon Johnson quote the best damn advance man in America well um, my mother saw this article in in the Toledo Blade and she sent it to me and there was Marty sitting in the rocking chair, one of President Kennedy's rocking chairs. I immediately called, found his number and called him up. Now we didn't have Google back then. 
So, you know, it was a little tougher. So I found him and I told him who I was, but I didn't know where to start, Steve. I, I didn't know where to start. So I, I sort of came across as, you know, I didn't really know what I called him for. I just wanted to talk to him. So I said, tell you what, let me send you 10 or 20 news articles about myself. Well, once he got those news articles, that was it. We were best friends for 11 years until the day he died. We talked to each other almost every day. It was like opening a book, and, but, he, but it spoke. And uh, he knew what I had in my collection. He says, you know something? I'm going to help make your collection a better. He goes, you have a lot of nice things, but you don't have anything personal of his. So Marty helped me get uh, President Kennedy's jewelry box, which was given to his from his father, honey, uh, not his grandfather, his father Joe, uh, in 1946 when he became a commerce, congressman. It was left at the LBJ Ranch. It has the Kennedy family crest on it. It's brown leather. I have the providence to it from Dave Powers, which Dave Powers was his best, best friend. Uh, and you open it up and there is all his cufflinks. And President Kennedy borrowed Bill Barnes, the lieutenant governor of, of, of Texas, he borrowed his cufflinks, and it's, they're the seal of Texas. On the back has his initials, BB, and they're still in there. So Marty helped me get that. His sweater that Jackie gave to him at his last birthday at Camp David has initials on it. It's blue and white. Uh, he helped me get the nine ink pens that Kennedy, oh, I think he signed 12 bills, but he has nine of them. The Peace Corps bill is in there the mental retardation bill, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear test ban treaty bill, uh, the river bill, the, 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 the treaty with Mexico bill. Um, so he helped me get those type of things. When you say he would help you, would he put you in touch with the owner? No, he did something unusual. He knew who had these things. He, he actually got me Lyndon Johnson's vice presidential seal, which essentially was a president's and two vice presidents because it was also Humph Humphreys. It was on the door at the old executive office building. And how he did it was, he knew, he knew um, Kenny O'Donnell, which of course was President Kennedy's appointment secretary. Well, his wife, I think her name was Lily, Kenny O'Donnell had died many years ago, and this was sitting in a box for 30 some years. And on my behalf, Marty secured the stuff. She'd had no use for it. And we arranged, you know, for payment and whatever, token amount, believe me, and he sold it to me. And he wanted to, to help me get something good in my collection. Beside the car which came later on. Right, right. Um, so you have this McDonald's, you've dedicated it sort of to Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens after that? You, you have several McDonald's. At I point. had three, yeah. Right. Were yeah. they all Kennedy things? No, I, I couldn't do that. Okay. No, and I couldn't do that. But my main one, the number one one, was always Kennedy, you know, so. Uh, Did you ever have any anybody complain about the decor? Never. They thought it was great. They'd bring school kids in. They, they thought, okay. I mean, Jimmy Dean was in there too. I Love Lucy was in there. Uh, the Three Stooges were in there. It was all, six, Frank Sinatra was singing My Way. Elvis Presley was, was singing I Have a Dream. So it, then, there, then you see a Kennedy commercial. Kennedy, 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 Kennedy's for you, you know, for me. Um, and, then, and then you see him do the nuclear test ban treat, speech, rather. Uh, and then you have music videos of the 60s. And then all of a sudden there's Kennedy. So, it, it, you know, it's, it, there was Kennedy in there subliminally. They, you know, they it's, liked it's it. It's amazing because we think of McDonald's being very consistent, always looking the same. Mm -hmm. But but the company had no problem with no. You changing the decor. Matter of fact, there's people today that have, that like motorcycles, so, so they make a motorcycle theme, or they're they're into trains and they make a trains go around the lobby, and uh, they want to give it something different. Hmm. Yeah. I guess we just don't have those in Dallas. No, I don't think you do. <laughs> uh, so let's see. In the early 90s, you uh, you acquire the car in the early to mid 90s, somewhere around um, About 1986, I saw a movie on TV called Kennedy, starring Blair Brown. Okay. And and um, and then we had the uh, Charlie, not Charlie Sheen, um, Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen played Charlie Sheen's son, uh, played Kennedy, and it was on a miniseries, I think, for three nights. So I had called the production company, and said, "Where's that car?" And they said, "We sold it." I said, "To who?" And they said, "We sold it to Kevin McDonald." I said, okay, so I called Kevin McDonald's, told him who I was, what I do, and I said, you know, wh what's this car like? And he says, it's a piece of junk. He says, they, they took a back seat and they put it for the jump seat. Uh, it, it was stretched terribly, it was wrong, it was, everything was wrong, it barely ran. He goes, but I'm gonna make it to the real one. And according to, according to, 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 uh, to, to um, Kevin, he took that car from the same blueprints. He got to know uh, Bill Hess from Hess and Eisenhart in Cincinnati. They became friends. 
and the daughter could substantiate that today that it was meticulously detailed right down to the Secret Service bumper and the inlay of rubber on, on the bumper area. Um, he had it for a few years. It was parked at a funeral home inside because where do you keep a 21-foot car? Um, from what I understand, it was a choice. Uh, either get rid of this car or, I'm, or you get rid of me. We need to buy a house. I said, well, I'll buy the car from you. I, I gave him a price, and he bought it. I bought it. Um, and uh, I took it to a different degree. The car looked very good when I bought it, but mechanically, it wasn't very sound. Um, structurally, it was sound. Um, the drive shaft was done right. The, the, the stretch is perfect. The detail was almost perfect. There's only three things different in the car. What it is, only three things. One, the jump seats are wrong. I just probably should rebuild the jump seats. I could probably do that from photographs. Two, the, the lights on the side, the, the, the spotlights, they should be called Unity number fives. I have more updated ones. I just can't find Unity five lights. And on the three, the only third thing is when you open the door, um, if you ever saw 64 Ford Fairlanes, when you open the door, that little rocker panel had like black ribbed in the, in the aluminum, sort of waved, mine's flat. But other than that, um, they even took that, I don't know if you'd call it a rocker panel, but the very panel below the whole length of the car, uh, Bill Hess, to, made the, to make the car look flat and like a tank, more, more solid, he added a piece like a V between that and he took the, stain, the stainless steel bar, uh, stainless steel trim that goes on the bottom. Instead of going in, it's straight. So when you look, when you look at it cosmetically, the car looks like a tank. And then he did the stretch uh, 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 in front of, of the, uh, the wheel rather than at the back wheel. So the car has a longer quarter panel and a longer door. And that's what gives it that look. There's no other car stretched like that. No cars are stretched like that today. They're not done like that. They're done the old, you know, they just cut them in half. Well, I saw the car today for the first time, and it's, uh, it's really extraordinary. Gary Mack's been telling me for years about it's the most accurate uh, Lincoln that he's ever seen uh, participate in any of these documentaries and things that uh, that he's that he's ever encountered in all his years, and I absolutely agree because it really is a, a fine a fine machine. It is. Uh, besides the car, tell me what else you've mentioned the jewelry box. What other uh, parts of your collection are you the most proud of? Um, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the piece that I really like the most. And it's probably worth five dollars. Okay is there was a coin bank and it's green and it's for mental retardation. You, you give a gift. Uh, it, it was probably set at a 7-Eleven or a grocery store and it's, it's clear, uh, like a mint green clear. It has President Kennedy's picture and it's him signing the mental retardation bill. It's just so unique and it, it, you know, he, thinking of his sister who he signed that for, uh, Kathleen, right? Or uh, Rosemary rather, for Rosemary. Uh, who lived in a, in a home just until a few years ago before she died at 90-some years old. Um, but he did that for everybody, but it was really a tribute to his sister. And I, I, I'm just thinking that, you know, here, here is this canister that I have, and I look at it, and I think, you know, just think when this was out in the si early 60s when he signed this, how many people just put money in that? It just, it's, just a, it's just a very small piece, but that's probably one of my favorite pieces and, of, of all. We were talking before the recording today that you're not as interested in the assassination and all of its nuances as you are the man himself, Kennedy. Yeah, that's right, Steve. Uh, what is it about Kennedy that you'd like so much? Um, first of all, he was human, and he had his faults. We all have our faults. Uh, I suppose if you took somebody's faults and put them on a sheet of paper on the right and your good points on the left, they could even match <laughs> the amount of you know numbers. But I like the fact that he was human and that his dirty laundry is out in the open, but he still maintained one of the top best presidents who ever you know, existed, okay? Um, I like the fact that he was an all-American guy. If he was around today, there's only one thing that, that he would probably uh, get criticized for, and that's his alligator briefcase, okay? Because that's not going to fly today, his alligator briefcase. But he was like you and I. He liked Heineken beer, which not, was not a domestic. He liked his Heineken beer on ice. In the morning, he liked to eat. He liked to eat eggs once over light, with toast, with jelly, with coffee. He dipped his toast in his coffee. He had bacon and eggs every day. That was his favorite thing, and he loved his clam chowder. 
Um, he loved his kids the way we love our kids. He thought of the future like anybody else. He didn't think he was going to die young, although there's been stories he thought he was going to. He didn't know what he was going to do with his life after the presidency. He probably would have won big in 64. Uh, he probably would have. Um, but I like, I like those type of things. You know, he, he was for the minimum wage. Okay, you know, he was for a prayer in schools. The issues, he was for Social Security. You know, you know back then, the minimum wage, I, did, did, why, there was no minimum wage. Why, why couldn't we have it? What was it, 95 cents an hour he was asking for? And that was, that was very liberal back then. So um, he really was for a little guy. And you know, Kennedy never took a salary. His salary was given away to, from what I understand, three different charities. It rotated. No one knew where the money was coming from. Never knew it was from the White House. That was a very closely guarded secret. Now, we have 65% of people in Congress today that are multimillionaires. I think they're all still taking that salary. So it's those things. You know, and you know, he smoked cigars but didn't want to see him smoking a cigar. Didn't like to see him wear hats. So he had all the little idiosyncrasies that maybe we have. So he was, he was very, very human. You know. Do you read as many books as you can on his life? Uh, I used to. Yeah, I used to. I get more from documentaries and listening to it over and over again. And But I used to read an awful lot about him. I have a, about a 400-book collection. Is there a particular favorite biography that you feel like really exemplifies the real JFK? Um, yeah, the, the one that there's, there's one called Kennedy, and it starts out with Tip O'Neill. It's actually a video. Okay. And he says, uh, it's been 30 years. My gosh, he's up there laughing. Is, is it, you know, I can't believe it's just got this big. And then uh, it, there's a song at the beginning, too. It says, uh, I know John Kennedy is in heaven. Have you ever heard that? I'm vaguely familiar. Was that from around the late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, okay. yeah. And it, it's done beautifully. And he talks about his life and his sisters. And his father was a disciplinarian, although not, it wasn't administered roughly. Uh, didn't talk much about his mother. Um, you know, and the, my, the, the, my favorite story is, is Ted Sorensen said, his speechwriter, said that when Kennedy got done with the debate, and you probably know this story, he walked over to a phone booth, no cell phones, he walked over to a phone booth, he called his dad, and his da dad says, Jack, you just did great. You just, you know, you just took Nixon and just put him in place. Well, the next day the crowds were quadrupled for Kennedy. The next day they were. That was the edge that put him over that 100,000 100, votes. Okay? He hung up the phone and here's what he said. Almost gives you goosebumps if you love your father. And most guys love their father. He said, you know, Ted, if I'd have fallen flat on my face, my dad would have said, Jack, you fell flat on your face. It was wonderful how you picked yourself up off the floor. And that says a lot about his dad. So his dad was a, a real positive man. And he doesn't get that, that credit, I don't think, from the public, from Joe Kennedy, you know. But there's from a father stand, a son standpoint to a father, that I'd have, you know, you'd have picked yourself, you picked yourself up great off the floor if he said I fell on my face. So much mythology surrounds Kennedy and this, this notion of Camelot. Uh, do, you, do you buy into that, or are you more interested in, in the reality of it? I think more the reality, you know, that Camelot came later. But Camelot, he loved the tune, and he would say, "Dave, uh, play it again." You know, you know, there once was a time in Cam. You know, he played it over and over and over. So it's sort of neat that it came about. You know, and we look back now. I mean, look what the country's been through in the last forty-eight years, and we're still remembering this guy. We can't remember what other president died forty-eight years ago. You know, uh, Eisenhower, Johnson. We don't remember any of those guys. Was it because it was on film? Was it because? It was documented. Was it? What is it? It's a lot. It's probably all those things. But it was. It was the man. He had character. You know. He had brains. He had. He had it all. And what also intrigues me is the loss. Is that what? What if? What you know? What happened? You know, Johnson would have never been president. We know that. Look at what happened in Vietnam. Maybe there'd been that kind of Vietnam. Kennedy would have never handled Vietnam the way Lyndon Johnson did. So the political aspect of it fascinates me. Of course. When Johnson didn't run, Bobby Kennedy wouldn't have ran. Bobby Kennedy wouldn't have got shot. And, of course, Nixon wouldn't have been in because Nixon only ran when Bobby Kennedy had the opening. So we know that Nixon wouldn't have been president. We also know that uh, Ford wouldn't have been president because there would have been no Watergate and there would have been no Ford. And the only reason why Carter won was because he pardoned Ford. So it goes. 
So I can't say after that. So what fascinates me is that 30 year period, we sort of got screwed as a country. And that, that I like to hold on to and say, gee, what would have happened, you know? But I look at JFK as a thoroughbred horse. Okay, those are the ones that race, those are the ones that win. He's the secretariat of political, of political people. And, and I'll give you an example. Here's a kid talking about to his father, the ambassador. Okay, who's the president of Ireland? Who's the chancellor of Germany? And these the families all doing the names. What's the policies of the emperor of Japan? What's his name? Main, and, and, and this guy was, he grew up to be something. So will we ever have somebody like that again? Probably not. He was one of a kind. They say a Kennedy comes along every 50 years. Roosevelt, Lincoln, Kennedy, Teddy Roosevelt. So I guess we're all waiting. Now, the car you have was used in numerous films and documentaries, and I know it was used in Oliver Stone's film. Mm -hmm. Did you own it at that time? Yes. Okay. Yep. Tell me about how that came about. Um, I was at my uh, McDonald's one day, and a guy calls me up from the transportation department and said, we're doing a movie on it called JFK. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was my friend you know, doing a joke on me because we like to use your car for a movie. And I said, Who, who's the director? They said, Oliver Stone. And I said, oh yeah, born on the 4th of July, right? Yeah, right. And I hung up on him. I, I thought it was my buddy down the street. And uh, the guy calls back, he goes, no, 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 we're really doing a movie on Kennedy. I said, oh, okay. So, so um, we did it, we came here, was, we shot here for 28 days. We went through Dealey Plaza 91 times. And um, I didn't have, I played a part in that movie. I, I, I was a secret, no, I was a cameraman sitting with Alton in, in the third or fifth car back on the, those guys that come through later after the assassination sitting on the back of the car, that was me. But you didn't drive your car in there? No, no, they had a, they had a stunt driver because they did a real reenactment. Mm -hmm. they, they jumped on the car, they did the whole, the whole, you know. Was this the first time that your car had been used in that way? Uh, in 91, yes, then it did Ruby in the same year did that here and then it did that was Sony Pictures and then it did a woman named Jackie in Richmond Virginia with Roma Downey Stephen Collins and then it did speed TV called behind the headlights uh, and then it did um, the uh, D discovery target car inside the target car JFK and then uh, two years ago it did the watchman and we shot that in Vancouver which was uh, done on a green screen but we had there were some people there and the Secret Service guy um, and that was only at the very beginning uh, that and this is actually the seventh movie that this car will be in it has quite a history yeah uh, did you get to talk to Oliver Stone and um, mm -hmm. t what was it like to be here on the set while this movie was well it was big it was big I mean people were following Kevin Costner everywhere they had a Kevin Costner lookout every day for the girls um, I, I worked with them every day I next to him he would ask me can we pull the seat out and I said well what are you gonna put in there and he'd say, well, we're going to put a cameraman in there. And I said, well, do you want to stand on the seat? Do you want to put boards? I mean, why do you need the seat out? Because the equipment's heavy. All right, we took the seat out. Uh, then he, he was always asked me about it, you know. And then he got in the back of the car, and he was filming from inside the car, directing certain tight shots. Um, they kept it over here in the West End garage. Uh, they paid me pretty good. They fed me well. They gave me complete access. I took hundreds of pictures. I still have them. Hundreds of pictures on the set. Um, it, it was that was big. Oliver Stone picture was big. Had a I think a hundred million dollar budget. Has your car ever been damaged during any of these shoots? Um, you know a scratch here and there, but you know I don't I don't really worry about it. I can always get a scratch fixed or a dent. Um, you know I don't like I like them not to happen. But it, when he did it, he he it got quite a bit destroyed in the back. So before it left, we painted it. Uh, but it was painted the wrong color. So I took it when I got back to Detroit and we painted the whole thing again. And the car was just restored again about two, about two years ago. Do you have a, an agent that handles these bookings for you? Do you do everything yourself? I, I wish I did. I don't. I do it myself. I negotiate it myself. Um, if I was a, a Branson, you know, with, with Virgin Records and Virgin Airline, I'd do it for free. But, you know, I have a job and I have certain, it, it costs four, five, or six thousand dollars to move it from point A to point B and back. I, it takes a, a big company. Um, but no agent, no, not really. The, the, you know, when we do some Kennedy movies, it, it stays, the car stays busy. It's a centerpiece of my collection, though, of my hobby, JFK Remembered, which I go into fairs. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but before we do that, I know that you have a very interesting story 
involving the car and involving your your passion for wanting to keep the car. Mm -hmm. Let me switch tracks on the camera, and then I'd like you to tell that. Okay. Story. Okay, pick him back up. You have quite a story to share. Yes. On the car, on the on the uh, situation that happened with me in the car. Absolutely. It, it's a bit of a sad story at the beginning. Uh, today I find it humorous. So sometimes what you find in tragedy becomes uh, funny. Okay. Uh, back in 1996, uh, I was getting a divorce, and it's like flying a jet. A jet, a jet airliner when the two pilots had a heart attack and the lady comes out and says, can anybody fly the plane? I'm probably going to crash the plane. Well, I crashed in a divorce because you've never been through it before. Um, what happened is my Kennedy collection became the centerpiece of the, of the legal fight. I've never been in a courtroom in my life. I've never uh, been arrested in my life. Uh, I was a businessman and a family man for, for 25 years. Uh, three kids, uh, work in my McDonald's like George Patton went through uh, Sicily. Okay, I, it, it's full steam ahead. Four o'clock in the morning every day. Well, all of a sudden, when you get divorced, uh, the judge ordered me to give the the wife and now her new husband uh, the car and the collection. Not half of it, the car and the collection, or this certain amount of extravagant allowed amount, amount of money, like three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars. Well, by that time, my McDonald's were gone, my houses, everything was gone. Uh, we sold everything, and the they sort of came around the back end and then wanted the collection. At first, nobody wanted anything. All of a sudden, it's worth $800,000. So my, when I fought this legally, I said, fine, let's get everything appraised. I'll pay for it. We'll appraise it three times, add them up, divide it by three. You're going to get a high, a low, and a middle. And whatever that is, I'll, I'll make payments. We're not going to get it appraised. Well, the car's worth $100,000, said the judge. Well, who said? Your ex-wife says, well, I'm the expert, okay? So why don't we get, my wife is not the expert. Why don't we get the car appraised two times and we'll divide it, by whatever, and I'll pay for it. Denied. I was in a southern court of South Carolina. Georgia V. Anderson was the judge, female. Uh, it's, it's a good old boy network is what it is. And I, I realized that I was getting the railroad, okay? I was a northerner in South, in South Carolina. That's why I had a couple of McDonald's there. Of course, I sold them. Um, so when we finally got to the courtroom, um, the judge said, you're in contempt of court. You have not returned this stuff in a year. You're in contempt of court. I didn't even know what contempt of court meant. I, I had no idea what that meant. And I asked my l lawyer, what does that mean? He said, uh, she'll send you to jail for a weekend. I said, jail? Jail? He said, well, that's a weekend. They just want to teach you a lesson. What did I do wrong? You didn't return the collection. Well, I'm not going to return the collection. Well, then that's what you go for. When the judge said a year and a day, Steve, my heart sank. I think my heart stopped for a few seconds. So what happened was um, I, you know, I nudged my lawyer and said, well, jail. He said, yeah, you go a week or a day or a couple weekend. I said, jail. He said, she just want to teach you a lesson. I said, for what? And she, he said, well, for not listening to her, for not giving the collection up. I said, oh, I, there's no way I can go for a weekend. Uh, who will feed my dog? Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going a little spastic here. So when the judge said a year and no more than a year and a day, my heart stopped. It had to stop for a couple minutes, a couple seconds. I, I was beside myself. I got my composure and I, when you're in a courtroom in the, and you're in a civil court, you can ask any question that you want. It's your time. So I asked a question to the judge. I said, judge, tell me, you want all my collection. And you want my collection to be sold on the steps and I can bid on it myself, which is ridiculous. Tell me, Judge, tell me, I've given half of everything. Tell me why this is fair to me that I have to give her all the collection. And the judge said, quote, who said I have to be fair? When she said that, a new energy came over me. I was with the company for 30 years, McDonald's Corporation, treated me always fair. They co-signed my note at the bank to get a McDonald's. Anytime I needed something, a hundred thousand dollar Playland, they bought the Playland. Of course, I paid them back. It was a it was a trust issue. They trusted me. I trusted them. We both won. When this person said that she didn't she did not have to be fair, it just hit the wrong nerve. So, I thought, well, if I got to be a fighter, I'm going to be a fighter. So I said, all right, let's go. Every three months, they would drag me in court, and they'd say, where's the collection? And I'll, be, and I'll tell you. I told them, I'll tell you where it is. Let me go get it. But they didn't let me out to go get it. Was I going to go get it? No. 
but I was going to get out. They never let me out. Um, I got out on good behavior at nine months because you so many days you do. Um, but when you they call you, for instance, in jail for food, they'll say, uh, "All right, cell number one, uh, Griffin, uh, Lawton." and Childs, and you get out and you start walking down to get your breakfast. And then cell two, they would say Mabry, JFK, and Allen. Well, I was JFK. <laughs> so um, it, it was miserable to be locked up. I, I can't describe it anymore. Um, I called my father and I said, Dad, what should I do? Should I just give her the stupid collection, give her the car, I can have it shipped here, I can have somebody go get it and pack it up. What should I do? And here's what he told me. He said, listen, and he was in World War II, worked for General Patton, okay? He said, listen, I've seen you collect this stuff since you were a little kid, and now I'm in jail. He's giving me this advice. He said, if you give her that collection, you're never gonna look at yourself in the mirror again. You're, you're gonna regret that the rest of your life. Stay there, make the best of it, and don't give it to them. So I didn't give it to them. They pursued me for another seven years. Uh, and of course, interest kept going up. And they finally gave up because they, uh, my lawyer told me, quote, who told the other lawyer, the other lawyer told my ex-wife, look, you might have give up because this guy is not, you're never going to see anything and this guy's not going to give you a pin on that collection. My advice is, you know, I can't help you. And he quit. Every lawyer she had quit because once we got going, it never, you know, never materialized. So you still have your entire collection? I have the entire collection. The only thing she took was the Kennedy Doodles aboard Air Force One that he drew on the way to Dallas. She's, she's got those, but I've got the Providence on it. So they're really not that, mu that good unless she has them authenticated. Uh, she's got those, that's about it. Um, but I've got the whole collection, the car. I wouldn't be here today talking to you to do this you know, documentary if, if I didn't uh, have the car. And uh, I like to say uh, that you know, one day when I'm on the Jay Leno show, in 2013 and Jay Leno sees the car and we do some film in the background because he loves cars, Jay Leno's garage. And the, he introduces me as, uh, there's three guys that were put in jail on JFK's behalf. One is Oswald, he's not in very good company. One is Ruby and here he is, the only living guy, Nick Shishelli. So um, now I find humor in it, as I said at the beginning. It, it's a very sad thing that somebody who you, you trust in your life can turn over money. Money can be very evil. You know, one year you have it, one year you don't. It's no big deal. But would I do it again? Yeah, I do it again, and I get in my car. Did the new owner of the 1960s McDonald's keep it that way? Uh, yep, he kept. I took. Well, I took. I took uh, JFK off the wall and took that home. Okay. Uh, he kept the uh, the 60s. He kept uh, James Dean and the Beatles and uh, John Wayne and all that in there. Yeah, but took the TV down. Is, but it, it's, is it still there today? Yeah, still there today. 14 years later, still there. Uh, set for a remodel. Did you ever think about getting back into that field? Um, back then, you know, it was easier to get a, to get a franchise. Um, if your credit score was halfway decent, even if you didn't have one, it was more of a, a good old boy network. They liked you. You had good, you know, that type of thing. You had a little bit of money. It was a roll of dice. You both won. Okay. Today, it's all corporate. It, it's you, how much money do you have? You, you got you got eight hundred thousand dollars. Well, we'll talk to you. You got eight hundred or eight thousand. They're not going to talk to you. Um, you know, there's a beginning in your life of certain things, and there's a middle, and there's the end. And unfortunately, that's the end uh, of that. So um, I opened up a museum called JFK Remembered in in Orlando. Uh, that made it for about ten months, and I uh, just couldn't get anybody to come to go from Mickey Mouse to JFK. That it was the wrong mix. But when that folded. What was born was JFK remembered the traveling museum. And I go to state fairs, and I go into a state fair for a 10 day period on a collectible contract, and the car is there, and it's guarded by a US Marine in dress blue, flat panel televisions. You walk in, it's Kennedy everywhere, movies, no assassination. Um, and it, there's everything in professional cases, and it's, it's a great tribute to them. And it's, what, what really gets me is when I see 14 year old people coming in there, and they're taking pictures and they're, they're just infatuated with JFK and they're 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And I say, come get your camera, go sit in the limo. I mean, it is, one kid came in out of Minnesota last year. He repeated every president backwards and forward. He was infatuated with the presidency. He said, one day I'm gonna be the president. And I, I think he is. And I got his autograph just in case he is. 
So the stories are great. I, I've been to your website and you have some remarkable pictures from the different venues you've been at. I remember one in particular that stands out in my mind. There were cheerleaders all over the, the limousine. <laughs> yeah. Is there a story there? Uh, that was a Razorbacks in um, Texas. That was in, um, uh, where was George Bush from? Uh, that's where it is, it's that place. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a rodeo. And the cheerleaders came in and they wanted to sit in the car and of course, you know, we got, we got them in a limo, so. <laughs> Do you um, ever give rides in there to, to people? They pay you for, for? No, it's not about money. Uh, when I take the car out, well, I don't have it with me anymore. The car is stored somewhere else now, it's off site. But when I had the car in Florida, and I had a house and you know family, I would take the car out to, uh, well, I would go through McDonald's drive through in the car. Or I'd park at the supermarket and I'd come out and there'd be people standing there. And even today, there was many people came out here today. There's a, always a few, Steve, as you know, when they walk through your museum, there's a few that you pick out that is immensely immersed in this thing. It's not this, they're just walking by. You can just tell they, and so that person, you want to know what, what, more about them. So today there was about a dozen of those people. And I said, come on over here and give me your camera. We took their picture in the car. I should clarify, you're in town today because National Geographic is doing a new documentary set to air, I think, later this year in yeah. November. And so you're here participating in that. Yes, yes. Um, the car is such a fascinating piece. You know, I, I was out there today and I saw people getting their pictures made in front of it. Uh, does that give you a sense of pride that you're able to, to impart that sense of history on these folks? Well, the guy that played JFK, uh, Mark, um, I said to him back there while we were resting, and I said, look, you've got four people over here facing the backs to the car. They're up on the grass, you know, someone's taking their picture. You've got two more over here doing the same thing. Look behind you, two over here. I said, you know what that tells me? Is that they haven't let go of Kennedy. For some reason, they want to be part of it. And that's sort of unexplainable. He's almost like uh, Ted Wooten, the, the, the news commentator said Kennedy is still very much in the family album. Uh, well, my generation is still in the movie business, making the movies. When you see certain movies, you'll see a picture of Kennedy, or they'll say they'll mention t JFK. I mean, he's out there, mm -hmm. and I guess I notice him more because I'm more in tune to it. But yeah, it, it does. It gives me a, a great satisfaction. I wish they could all come in, stand in the line, and just sit in the car or something. It's a great thrill to them. There's people today from China. There's people today from Korea sat in the car, uh, from Shrimp on the Bobby was there, from Down Under, uh, a couple people. And it, it, it is, it's a nice feeling. You never know what gonna, they're going to go back and say or think about it. Maybe they'll start their collection or something. But yeah, it, it is, it does give me some satisfaction. You've been here with the car in Dealey Plaza several times. Does that feel strange to you? Does, is it eerie to be in the car in the middle of Dealey Plaza? Um, you know, this is going to sound really different, okay? Somebody asked me that the other day at, at work. They said, gee, you're going to shoot where Kennedy was, uh, you're going to film where Kennedy was shot. And I said, yeah. And they said, you're going to drive the car there? And I said, yeah. And I said, I think we're going to do a lot of stills, so we're probably going to sit there a lot. And they said, how does that feel? I said, well, I'll tell you something. Are you excited? And I said, well, you know, 91 times with Oliver Stone. So I've driven through there more than with uh, Greer, <laughs> William Greer. Okay, and Roy Kellerman, the Secret Service agent, in the front seat of his car that day. Um, it's sort of like being in my living room. I'm very comfortable there, and I and I can't explain it. I, I sit there and I look at the, you know the grassy knoll and the chip paint on all the structures, and and I think about the 76 degree weather that day and how the rain parted and the top was off, which was customary. It was no big deal. The top wasn't on, you know. And there's 11 hour, 11 mile an hour wind that day from what I understand, and he doesn't even remember Dealey Plaza co going through it. it. It was, you know, but yet today we know Dealey Plaza. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it, it, it's a, still a little eerie, but I feel also feel very comfortable there because I'm bringing, from for what I've stood for and now what I've had to actually sacrifice for of the, the jail situation is now it's even worth more to me. Now it's even more valuable to be here today with you and to be here with this car because I know that I did what I had to do. Uh, you know, I didn't see that train coming. And, you know, sometimes they say people pick up cars when their loved one's under it. You never know what is going to be thrown at you and you never know what strengths you have mentally, physically, or whatever until something happens. And that was mine. You haven't brought your museum to the Dallas area, have you? No. 
Well, I'd like to, uh, it, 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 but it takes um, space. Um, I was, I was, State Fair of Texas. I've tried to get in the State Fair of Texas, and I call them every year, and they told me again this year, no, and last year, no, and the year before, no. I, I send uh, beautiful photos. I don't know if maybe it's too close to, I don't know why, but I can't, can't get it in the fair. It seems strange that you know you have this you have this exhibition and yet the spot where it would be um, most appreciated perhaps. Massachusetts was good. New York people had in New York we were there for 17 days. We had 330,000 people through there, which is what you guys get in a year, right? About that. We did 330,000 people in 17 days. That's it, I was I was shocked actually. We kept putting up one theater rope, then we did another line. You know the line. Mm -hmm. Then we did two. We had 15. We had 15 lines. It was one, two, three, fifteen, and then the line going in. What's the admission price? Nothing. What I I don't like to charge an admission. I I like to go in with look, give me this amount of money. This will cover shipping the car. This will cover my help. This will cover my profit. Uh, this will cover my expenses, and then let them come in off your ticket price. So, for instance, for you, if you guys did it, if something here, that's how we would do it. I see. But here I do it for free. We just have to get the, everything <laughs> here. Uh, eventually, where would you like to see the car when you're gone from the Well, when I'm gone, really the car is, is only one place it should be. That's here. Because this is where it all happened. This is where people remember the car. They don't remember the car in Tampa, Florida. I do. They don't remember the car in Berlin. I do. You do. You remember the car in Germany. Nobody else does. So you remember the car at the Space Center when he was looking at the rockets with Von Braun. Okay, but no one remembers the car anywhere else. O only people remember the car is Dallas, Texas. They don't remember the car in Washington, D.C. Only people that lived in Washington, D.C. remember the car in Washington, D.C. So really, the car should be here in Dallas. The Kennedy Library wouldn't want it because it's too negative. You know, so it, it, it would be a great fit there, but it'd be, it'd be far too negative. I think if the car was here, it'd be a huge draw. I, I think it would be a, just a huge draw and something you can publicize for five more years just so you, you got the car. And now that the history of the movies behind it, that adds a lot more credibility to it that it's actually produced and you know people like movie cars, people like movie stars. So um, yeah, I'd like to see it here. Uh, the exhibit that you have, that, that how, how much of your year is taken up dealing with Kennedy, dealing with your collection, dealing with this museum exhibition? You know, people have asked me that. That's a good question. That's a very good question. A lot of people ask me that question. Um, earlier, when I was with my business, I would spend, uh, I, it wasn't by a day of the week. It was multitasking all day in between. I still do that. As I work uh, during my day, as I have a day off, as I have traveling, I've worked here, uh, I'm multitasking. So it's, it's a combination of, of my whole week. I, I can't give you a percent. But I'm constantly making phone calls and trying to do this or trying to do that. Or I don't buy anything anymore. I don't buy any more collections. I don't really buy anything. Um, in 2013, my plan is to sell off a lot of my collection. That the things that I don't need that I will never show, and and have a, a JFK remembered exhibit, you know, a catalog online, and actually sell, let somebody else have all this stuff because I don't know what to do with it. Um, I have a I have a large a lot, a lot of paper. I have the first day covers, coins, stamps, movies, uh, first day covers, uh, keychains, ink pens, pins, buttons, gold, uh, metallic art, uh, bronze, silver. Uh, I mean, there's collections with stamps. I have a wonderful stamp collection on Kennedy, wonderful. But how do you display it? So, um, you know, I'll probably do that. And What was the last piece you bought? Um, uh, the last piece I bought, boy, that's a good question. Um, wasn't Kennedy related, but it was Secret Service pins to, to Ronald Reagan's White House uh, of, of his car. Those are pins that it's shaped like his limo. Hmm. That, yeah, I bought those. But I don't, you know, it's a lot of things I want still. I want that. But then I put it in a box and I forget it. One time I bought a collection out of Pennsylvania. It was $600, and it was Life magazines and the traditional things like that. But there was one thing in there that I wanted, and they didn't see it. But I did when I went and looked at it. It was in the bottom of the box, so I shoved it back on the bottom of the box. 
And I said, how much do you want for all this? He goes, uh, how about 600? I said, fine. And I, <laughs> I left with it. And what was in there was a pin and ribbon from 1907 from Honey Fitz, his grandfather running for mayor of Boston. Fabulous piece. And when you walk into my JFK Remembered exhibit, that's the first piece you see floating in the air is, is that. This is where it all started from his grandfather. So, um, and the rest of the stuff, you know, I just left in the box. I think it's still in the box, but. Did you ever communicate with other uh, high profile Kennedy collectors like Robert White when he was still alive? Yeah, I met Robert White uh, once. He came to my house and when we spoke, we were like brothers. We had so much in common. And Robert was uh, disturbed at the time because his museum in Tampa was set to close. And he came to my house and he said, what am I going to do with all these things? And I said, Robert, um, you have the greatest collection in the world. No doubt about that. You have you know, his glasses, his passport. So look, I know how to get this stuff on the road. Logistic wise, I'm your DHL. Okay, Why don't we marry these two, th but you don't have the car. Let's take the car, forget all my stuff, put your stuff in, your PT-109 boat, all that, and we'll have a blast. I said, but first, I'm going to New York to do the New York State Fair and the Tennessee State Fair. This is in, I think, 2003. I came back and he died. I think he died right after that. And, and that was the end of that conversation with Robert. But him, I collect, I'm, I'm a member of the KPIC, the Kennedy Political Item Collectors. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first members in 1976. Really? Yes, I'm one of the founding members of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I went to a couple conventions and you know, got a couple of little awards and things like that. I don't go to them anymore. I don't really go to them anymore. You know? Again, a lot of people are fascinated with his death. And while I like to know what happened, I like to fascinate myself and you know, you know, interest on his life. Because I think that's, you know, that's the important part of it. And it's, yeah, a fascinating life. Tragedy, and you know. But it's been very fascinating. At the um, the end of these conversations, if there's anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to share with us, it's left open for you. Okay. Well, you know, um, I spoke a lot to uh, Melody Miller, who was the deputy press secretary of, okay. of Edward Kennedy, the F Kennedy family. Through the years, we had a 30-year a relationship with a hands, I would call it a hands uh, length effort, arm length effort, or rather relationship with Ted Kennedy's office. That That is that... He didn't speak to me directly, although I met him a couple times. And he wrote me a beautiful letter saying, on behalf of the entire Kennedy family, uh, through your collection, keeping the President's memory alive in your heart, uh, through your extraordinary collection, thank you on behalf of the entire Kennedy, uh, Kennedy family, I, I, I'm Ted Kennedy. Wonderful letter, okay? Um, when somebody had something to buy, Melody Miller sent them to me, or sell, rather. Um, when I went to jail, I wrote a letter JFK Jr. And basically it was, I'm in jail. Here's why. I want to meet you. And when I get out, I want to give you your father's jewelry box. It's yours. Well, he didn't answer me. When I got out, Melody Miller called me. Uh, and she left me a message. And then I called her. But the, le the message she left was this, because I obviously it was on my tape recording machine. It said, uh, I got your message. I got your letters from jail. Obviously we could not answer you from jail because the press is going to, you know, catch wind of it and think there's something there. But um, the senator said that he admires your moxie, which is a term that he used and his father used. It's guts. I didn't know what moxie meant. I had to look it up. <laughs> okay. And Melody Miller told me, she said, quote, when you catch your breath, give me a call. You're gonna, we're going to meet John Kennedy Jr to get that jewelry box for you. I said, okay, when? She said, well, summertime, sometime before Christmas. Well, I got out in April. He had plane went down in July. Uh, never got to give him his jewelry box. And I was gonna ask him for a job, by the way, at the newspaper. So I, I, I think I would've got it. I think he might've liked me. So about a year later, I said, well, let me give the jewelry box to Caroline. I don't want anything. I don't even have to meet her. I want to give the jewelry box to her. So I went through her husband, Schlossberg. Uh, I got a very curt reply from his second, from her secretary, his secretary, that they're not interested. Uh, when I met him at the Kennedy Space Center, um, he was there doing an exhibit. 
and uh, I, I had a packet of my stuff I sent to Marty, sent to every president, and they read it, and Jimmy Carter signs it. He sees my picture as a little boy with the white horse, six white horses, the grave. Uh, he take, took it and literally sent it back to me. So um, uh, I didn't do anything else with, with that. There must be guarded or something, I don't know, but uh, that, that was that. Um, but, you know, I'm going to do Kennedy probably till, you know, till I, whatever. I always want to open up a museum, but I did that once, and it's tough to, op to have a museum. It's, it takes, it's tough to get people to come to a museum. Uh, so um, the traveling museum works well for now, and, um, you know, so that's, uh, that's my, uh, my Kennedy story. Wow. Extraordinary. And that's great, and I applaud you for doing what doing your part to keep this this story alive. We do our part here in Dallas as well. You certainly do. Do a great job. It's an extraordinary car. Thank you so much for taking Thank the you. time to speak with us. Thank you for having me.